When I first met Peter, I called him Mr Cushing and he got rather cross and said, I couldn't call him that, I'd have to call him Peter. And I said, and I couldn't do that either. So I said, how about if I call you Sir Boss? And I called Mrs Cushing Lady Boss. And he became known as Sir to most everybody. I first started working for Sir in 1958. My typical working day was never typical. It could be um, seven o'clock in the morning, he'd call and want me to go, or it could be midnight because he wanted a strip done. So it was, it was a 24 hour job really, but one I absolutely loved. He and Mrs Cushing used to have a house in Kensington and when he wasn't working, they had some friends who lived in Whitstable and they used to go and stay with them during the time he wasn't working, a bit of a holiday and he could go walking and, or learn his lines or whatever. And then this house came up when he was beginning to earn a little bit of money. And so they bought it. And if he was working in London, he would stay in London. And when he wasn't, he would come to Whitstable. He adored it. He really, really loved it. I don't think there's a tea room in Kent that I haven't visited. We used to go for afternoon tea. And he hated cubed sugar and butter that wasn't in a butter dish. <laughs> And they would, we'd have to cross them off the list because he didn't want to go. <laughs> the Tudor tea rooms was very much in his life. He loved the family. I used to go and collect his lunch. They used to do special lunches for him. They loved him and he loved them. And to this day, there is still a picture over the table where he used to sit. Peter had immeasurable hobbies. He was the most wonderful painter. He was a wonderful model maker. He did scenes, his home in Whitstable, up in the studio, he had the one whole complete wall with different sets. He loved people and he would never ever not give an autograph or shake a person's hand if they met in the street because in his mind they were the people that put him where he was and he was very grateful for that. And I can remember at one stage a car had hit his bicycle in the high street in Whitstable and he came off his bike. He didn't hurt himself, but he came off. And a fan came up to him and said, aren't you Mr Cushing? So he said, indeed I am. He said, can I have your autograph? Mailing in mind, he's laying on the floor. And he said, yes, dear chap, would you like it in blood? Lady Boss died in 1971. Um, she had emphysema and um, she had been ill for a long time and I knew it was terminal because my own father died of emphysema as well, so I knew that uh, she wouldn't, you know. But she, she was bright and she never made a great fuss about it, you know. I think his grief was something that he never ever came to terms with. Although by the time he died, Mrs Cushing had been gone almost 25 years. But I, he never ever got over it, ever. And he missed her dreadfully. I don't know whether I should say this because people do tend to take things the wrong way. But he did often cry and I would just hold him. There was nothing, nothing um, sexual or anything like that in it. Uh, but he just needed to be held and comforted. In his biography, he did write that he was so desperately unhappy and he wanted to be where Helen was. Um, and he did think of suicide. He would ride on his bike all the way to Canterbury, he was up and down hills from Whitstable, and he looked at a pylon, and he thought if he climbed up there, maybe he, it would kill him. But the thing that stopped him more than anything was whoever found him, it wouldn't be pleasant. And he knew that Helen had said, when your time is right, you will come to me. And he didn't want to um, break any, th you know, he didn't want a chance that maybe if he did do something, he wouldn't get to her. And I have a great feeling that he did get to her. Well, he stopped painting 
um, really when Mrs Cushing died um, and he went into what he called his blue study and even I would go down to Whitstable and make sure he was okay and he would stand at the door and say there's nothing wrong with rejoicing I'm fine you can go home now because he just couldn't cope with anybody at first and then unfortunately he became very very poorly and was rushed off to hospital um, and he hated hospital and he said please will you get me out of here but the hospital wouldn't let him go until he had someone to look after him and I lived farther into towards London Kent as he lived down on the coast so we agreed that he could come and live with us until he felt he was well enough to go home and live. And he, he was marvellous really when I think of how he came into a family with the noise and everything. Although the girls were good, they still made noises that children make. They were very good to him and he to them. And I think that's, that helped him a lot to come out of his blue study. One particular day I had to leave him, we were going to a wedding and I was very worried at, at to what he would do. He wasn't a television man. Radio, but not television. Um, and he said, oh, Joycey, I wish I could, I wish I had some paints here. I haven't, they're all at home. I said, no, sir, when you left your house in Hillsley Road, um, I asked you what you wanted me to do with them. Oh, you said, throw them away. Well, I didn't. I said, they are, are actually all up in the loft. There are brushes, there are paint, um, paints, there's um, pe um, paper that you can paint on and he said oh would you get some down and before I we went I got everything down for him and rigged up a table so that he could paint and that was the first time he had painted in nearly I suppose 12 years but to get back to his painting to me it was just wonderful because he was just lost in it. Before Sir died Bernard and I went on a holiday and um, he was quite poorly and a friend looked after him while we were away. But every holiday that I ever had, he would do a painting for me. And the one you can see now is the very last one he did. And how he did it, I don't know, because he had terrible eyesight by this time. And it's a very treasured picture. I always kept in touch with John Ribchester, who was his doctor. And I always knew that if it was anything really wrong, John would tell me and I would know what to do. But when it came toward the end of his life, I also knew that I wanted him to have dignity. And he had said to John, you know, if I have to go into a hospice, I will. And I rang John and I said, would you send the, I think they were the uh, Macmillan nurses, would you send them round so that he can see them and see how he feels because I don't want anyone to think that you know we've put him in somewhere and he shouldn't be there it's got to be what he wants anyway the Macmillan nurses came to see him and reported back to John and that's when John said well you know I think it's the times the times right now but once he went into the hospice he was in there for about 10 or 12 days and the last I suppose the last four days of his life. I stayed at night. I slept in a chair by the side of his bed. And on the day he died, um, I, I went to make him a cup of tea. No, I went and had a wash and I came back and he looked at me and he didn't look at all well and he just went like that. And I knew he wanted a cup of tea. So I went and made him a cup of tea and came back. And it was in those spouty things, you know, and he couldn't manage it, so I, I was wetting my fingers and putting it round his lips, you know. And he, he was okay. He, 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 he kept sitting up and putting his arms out, and I thought, this is... And I, I spoke to the nurse, and she said, look, I promise you, if anything happens, or it's going to happen, I'll ring you. And I'd gone home, and I was totally exhausted, and I went and had to sleep, and I woke up, and... Bernard said he'd gone and when I saw the nurse she said he asked me when the time was near 
would I make sure you weren't here? Because he didn't want to see me upset. So, and my caring stopped. <laughs> and I miss him. When Whitstable decided that the groins needed replacing on the beach, there was a lot of old wood hanging around. And Sir got in touch with a, a little one-man business that made garden seats out of the groins. And he had what he called the love seat made. That was a seat just for two. By this time, he'd heard that we were going to do this Cushing's view. He always stood there and looked out to sea, always. Well, on his walks every day. And he said, I think I'm going to give it there so that when I'm there, I can have a sit on it. So I said, well, I think that's a good idea. So he donated it to Whitstable. So he was a, was a good Christian, and he, he never did anything wrong. He wouldn't hurt anyone, and he wouldn't tell anybody anything that wasn't true or do anything that he, might, he thought might hurt someone. He was, he was a lovely man. Uh, I know I'm biased, so, <laughs> but he was, he, he was absolutely lovely um, and I was very, very fortunate to work for him for as long as I did. <laughs>